All right then. Well, that's the end of the regularly scheduled material. Uh, there were some questions that you guys said that you had that you were gracious enough to hold until this point. So if there are any questions, I can ask, answer them now. Okay, yeah, Joe, actually, um, I would like to know, I mean, I'm, I'm, as you know, a high school teacher mm -hmm. and comfortable with, uh, with teaching teens and all that, but I will be teaching adults here in the next few months. Mm -hmm. And so could you give me maybe three strategies that you would say are essential for effective training of adults? Okay, so like the three most important things that I would make sure I include in any adult training. Right. I think the first thing to understand is motivation. Because adults are motivated to learn information when they think there's an actual value to them. So I don't know if you're familiar with this acronym, with them, what's, what's in it for me. People want, adults want to know why this is valuable to them, why they need to be concerned with whatever it is. And you have to be careful to make sure that they understand that there's a direct link between what you're trying to teach them and what their actual lives and how this is going to benefit them. I've had, um, in a previous assignment, I taught performance management software to uh, an agency I used to work for. And they had an old performance management system that they had been using for quite some time. And people were comfortable with it. A lot of people didn't see any reason to really switch it and change up to something different. And it was, up to me to teach them why it was essential for them to learn this new system when many of them didn't, didn't feel like they should. Um, a big part of that was telling them that their own performance evaluations were, at least in part, going to depend on how effective they were in communicating this information to everybody um, in the way that they used the new system and how effectively they were able to use the new software. So if Michelle has nine subordinates and she doesn't do a good job of doing things in the new Pegula system and she's still sticking to the old um, hard copy evaluations that we used to use. Well, Michelle's supervisor isn't going to be able to sign off on these documents because they have to go into the system and actually edit the documents. If she doesn't do that, it's going to affect her leadership evaluation. And Michelle's not gonna like that at all. So everyone's got a, they've got an incentive to keep going. Level of engagement is another one. You have to have, adult learners need to be involved with what they're doing. Because which way is more effective? If I tell you something, if I show something to you, or you actually act it out when you're trying to do it. Which do you think is most effective? Act it out. If you can go through it and do it, then you know that you've actually got it. Uh, if you just hear it or someone shows it to you, you're less likely to retain all that information. The other part is actual application of learning at the end. Adult learners need to understand, um, they need to be able to show you that they actually have the skill set, if at all possible, before the end of the class. It's one thing for me to say, who understands everything we're doing by show of hands? Everybody sticks their hand up, even though three of the people in the back have this glassy look on their face. <laughs> and said, do you understand? Yes, but I have no idea what you're talking about. And that's one of those things we have to be careful about. You need to make sure that at the end, they teach it back to you. They demonstrate that they actually have the skill set. If you focus on motivation, engagement, and demonstration, you'll be good. Great. Excellent question. Yeah. Thanks, that's great. I have a question. So what might um, instructional risk taking look like in an adult learning environment? Uh, it's important to make sure that you keep people engaged. And we talked about that here, making sure that people understand um, not only why they're doing, but level of interest doesn't stay constant during the course of a class. 
you can start them out at a high point and you need to make sure because there's a natural wane at a certain point you have to pick the neck up and then they'll wane and you have to make sure that you keep things high enough so that everybody is engaged in the class because you've got a bunch of different people doing a bunch of different things you know Melinda may be very interested in what I have to say while Burrell may not be interested at all in what I have to say I went through this class six months ago I don't understand why my boss has me here I could be playing golf you know I could be picking my toenails I could be doing anything other than being here right now because I have no interest in this class and if Burrell starts checking out it's really easy for that to spread through a class and for you to lose your group one of the things that I've done before is when you've talked to people and you start to look out of the room and see glassy looks, you do little things to try to shock people, like I sing. And you could have, you're talking about facilitation and all of a sudden, and everybody in the room says, wait. Hey. And you know, if you, if that doesn't get everybody's attention, you could do Fedruba, Hog Fedruba, can you feel the cry? So it said, do I have to go to Latin? I tried Italian and German. You're typically going to have everybody's attention by, by mm -hmm. the And some people will think, this guy's an absolute nothing. Mm -hmm. But you'll have everybody's attention in the room. Right. Because I took a risk to step outside the box to draw everybody back in when they weren't necessarily engaged before. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. I have a question, Joe. Yes, sir. Um, since knowledge of the customer is a necessary element in all training, what types of customer knowledge do you think are necessary to build credibility in the classroom? And how might this customer knowledge be included in your delivery? I think you have to know your audience whenever you're giving a training. So it's if you wouldn't give the same approach to a group of firefighters that you would to a group of nuns, necessarily. So you understand the culture of the group that you're talking to. You understand what it is that they value. You understand the way they interact with each other. Uh, jargon, if there's a particular uh, way of speaking, in that organization, if you can pick up some of that and use some of those words along the way, that can be really helpful. One of the things I like to do is show up early for a class and get the people as they come in, try to find as much information as, they can, as I can about those people. I understand that Michelle went to Emory University. I went to Emory University. So we got that in common. She works at Emory University now. Her husband works at Emory University now. And it's one of those things, if it's a point of connection that I have with Michelle, and a big part of facilitating, has anybody ever done any sales in here? We got two or three people in here that are, have done sales in the past. You understand that part of sales is always about selling yourself. It's not just about selling the product, yeah. because if people like you, they're much more apt to buy from you. Mm -hmm. What you're doing as a facilitator is selling the material. <laughs> And if you don't sell the material effectively, if you don't sell yourself, it's a lot harder to sell the material. And that's one of those things that comes along with it. So if I know certain things about Michelle, you know, I can use those to pull her back in or use her as an ally through the course of the training. Burrell went to Georgia State, undergrad. He just got his PhD. He is a principal at a small private school. These are all things that I can use to work with him. And if Burrell checks out again without having to sing, I can use certain things about it to pull things in. Georgia State has his second football season this year. Burrell's a football nut. I can talk to him about Georgia State's um, football season co coming up this year. And he was fired up about Bill Curry being the football coach. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that may not seem like it's related to the material, but if I can use things here and there to keep people engaged in the class, everybody keeps moving at the same speed in the same direction, and it makes things so much easier. <laughs> Otherwise, it gets to be a point where you're hurting cats, <laughs> and that's, that's dangerous from a facilitation standpoint. So 
understanding as much as you can about the culture of the organization, understanding as much as you can about the individuals in the room that you're facilitating to, understanding the way people interact with each other in that organization. If you've got mixed classes where you've got frontline staff, managers, and executives all in the same room, how do they interact with each other? And how does that affect how you have to interact with them as a group? Mixed groups are more challenging to teach. It's always easier to teach one thing to one kind of people. If you've got a bunch of different people in the room with different ability levels, different levels of ego, it gets more challenging. But the more things that you know about the organization and the individuals themselves, the better you can be at pulling things together and making your facilitation successful. Does that make sense? Yes. Excellent. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. You guys have been a great group. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.